Pearl Battle and I'm the chairperson of Anchor. And you see, we just met Jane, who's our vice chair. And this is the third in a series of, uh, of sessions that we're running about the sustainable development goals. Uh, before we begin, I am going to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting. So we have got people from all over the world here today, literally. Uh, but for me, I am in uh, Melbourne. So I meet, I, um, I live on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So as I said, we've been running, this is the third of these sessions. There's 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about um, SDG number one, which is no poverty. I don't think it's any mistake that that's the like SDG one, uh, because we know that when people are living in poverty, it makes it so much harder for them to access other sustainable development goals like um, hunger, like uh, zero hunger, like having access to health and well-being, like having access to quality education. Having enough money is so fundamental to the way in which we all live. So I think it's, it is an incredibly important STG. It's also uh, particularly relevant because it's Anti-Poverty Week, World Homelessness Day, and also International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. I just looked online just to sort of see how we're sitting. And apparently there's 300, oh, sorry, um, 3.24 million people in Australia who live in poverty below the poverty line. So that's almost, I think, one in eight adults and one in six children. Uh, and that is, um, yeah, like it's, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking to think that that's where we're at. Those figures were from February this year. So again, I worry what you know, the figures from February next year are going to look like given now that we have COVID and, and what that's been to so many people's livelihoods. I think this is an incredibly important topic for us to be talking about. And the purpose of these sessions really is to create conversation. These are really the sorts of things that we're talking about, hunger, poverty, uh, clean sanitation, like in many parts of the world, these are incredibly wicked problems. There is no easy answer. But I think that the thing that we can do as neighbourhood houses is start having some different conversations, start trying to conceptualise some of these issues differently, start thinking about how we can work together to change the conversation. So to that end, we've actually got an incredibly interesting panel uh, today of speakers. Um, uh, and so without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Sophie um, from the United Nations Australia Victorian Division. And she is going to um, talk a little bit broadly about this STG, and then um, I'll introduce you to the rest of the panel. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this conversation again. Um, just uh, as a very quick introduction, the Sustainable Development Goals were agreed to in 2015 by 194 member states around the world, so basically all the member states of the UN. Um, they are designed to be a framework uh, which covers off on everything of importance across the world. They're designed to build the most sustainable, resilient world, um, and they've certainly been affected badly by COVID um, in terms of progress, but they also provide a roadmap to come out of COVID, so hopefully they will be used in that way. Um, they are designed to stand alone, um, and we'd encourage any of the neighbourhood houses who want to look at um, how they can incorporate the SDGs, and I'm always happy to speak to anybody, um, to look at those that are most relevant to you. You might start off by thinking that um, one only is relevant to you, but once you start looking into it and you see the way they connect with each other, it may lead you into more, um, but that you certainly don't have to take them on as the whole 17 goals um, in the one go. But in terms of SDG 1, it's arguably the most uh, likely to be impacted by COVID. Um, in terms of uh, global poverty, the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world had actually declined from 36% in 1990 to 10% in 2015. So it, there had been amazing progress. It's now looking possible that uh, the global pandemic could increase global poverty by as much as half a billion people. We'll be interested to see over the next few years how that does develop. Um, just as some characteristics um, which come under the goal, um, those who live in extreme poverty are classified as those who struggle to access the most basic needs of health, education, access to water and sanitation. So it's slightly more broad than just access to finance. The poverty rate in rural areas is considered to be three times higher than those in urban areas. Um, having a job, as most people would know, don't, doesn't guarantee that you won't live in poverty. 
Um, Eight percent of employed workers and their families were considered to be living in extreme poverty in 2018. One in five children, so which underscores the need for social protection for all people, which we'll discuss. Um, and in terms of um, what we will cover in the uh, um, session today and the relationship to neighbourhood houses, um, as part of the targets for the goal, uh, the goal, some of the targets include implementing nationally appropriate social protection systems by 2030, so systems like universal basic income, uh, by 2030 ensuring that everybody has equal rights to economic resources and access to basic services, including microfinance, which I know some houses are involved with, and also gender sensitive strategies, make sure that uh, there are um, particular programs, um, as has come up in the last, the, as a result of the federal budget. Apologies for my dog and the doorbell. Um, and I think Mary uh, will cover off on this more, but some of the things that we're now talking about in terms of what people can do to help are doing things like buying from companies that pay people fairly, that will have a big impact, saving, borrowing and investing responsibly, uh, are calling for decent wages and opportunities for all, and learning about the causes of poverty at home and abroad. And uh, so they'll be things that we discuss today. So I shall go on mute now that the dog's made all the noise and hand back to you, Nicole. Thanks, Sophie. And, and I mean, Sophie's exactly right. Neighbourhood houses are doing work in the Sustainable Development Goals all the time. And this is one where neighbourhood houses do a lot of work. Certainly at the moment with the pandemic, lots of neighbourhood houses have really um, probably stepped up more than they ever have before because they're being called on for emergency food relief. That's certainly been a big area of need where we're seeing um, this really come to the forefront. But equally, it, we also do a lot to address some of the structural causes of poverty. So certainly in Victoria, lots of our neighbourhood houses run accredited and pre-accredited training. Uh, as a way to um, get people into work, particularly people, um, more marginalised learners who haven't had access to good education. Uh, the work that we do with them to get up their literacy, their numeracy, so that they, they can get into jobs that go on to further training. So there's lots of amazing work that neighbourhood houses do in this space. And we're going to be hearing some of those examples today. But first of all, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, Mary Waldridge. Um, I've met Mary a couple of times um, and Mary has a long history with neighbourhood houses in Victoria. Um, having been, I think you were the minister, I can't remember what, what the, your exact title was at the time, but neighbourhood houses certainly came under your watch, under your purview. Uh, and Mary is now the newly appointed chair of the Australian Board of Directors for Global Citizen. Uh, Global Citizen is a movement of engaged citizens who are using their collective voice to end extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, with 28 million actions to date, they've impacted 656 million people. So I'm really glad that you can be here with us today, Mary. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole, and thanks, Sophie. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. And I too would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional of the land from which we all meet um, right across the, the country and, and pay my respects to elders past, present, emerging. Um, it's wonderful to be uh, part of today's conversation and what I've been asked to do is just talk about Global Citizen because Global Citizen's objective um, to be the catalyst for, for driving change and driving investment um, to end extreme poverty in 2030. Um, so very on, on topic in relation today and from neighbourhood houses' perspectives and participants' perspectives, um, there may be a way that you're interested in getting involved in some of the global citizen work because we make it very accessible for people um, to uh, engage on these really fundamental issues. Now, I'm just going to share my screen and go through a presentation here. There we go. Great. Hopefully that's up. Um, so um, now let me see if I can actually move forward. This is, there we go. Okay, so as um, the, uh, global citizens about mobilising people um, to use their collective voice to end extreme poverty um, and I'll flick straight on to um, essentially uh, 
rather than determine new priorities, we're, we're completely backing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we particularly focus on goals one to six, uh, which are the fundamentals in relation to uh, you know, human rights, uh, human dignity, uh, and uh, the, the quality and, and experience of life. So ending poverty, uh, no extreme hunger, health, education, uh, sanitation, and so on. Um, and that uh, our efforts are focused on ensuring that investment is driven to those areas um, so that uh, the work of agencies across the board, usually multilateral agencies, but agencies across the board um, uh, can get on and have the investment to, to make the, the changes that are needed in those areas. Um, as was said, um, before COVID, um, the world was already off track from ending extreme poverty by 2030. So there had been a dramatic decline over the uh, first 15 years of this century, um, but the trajectory of change had actually um, uh, changed and reduced um, and there was already concern. Um, what had been identified now, of course, is that COVID has had uh, a significant impact on that. Um, and the conservative estimates are this year alone in 2020, that there will be an additional 70 million people who um, move back into extreme poverty that's living at less than $1.90 a day. Um, and those numbers could be as high as 100 million. That's this year alone, um, without the, the expectations of what happens uh, next year and beyond. So um, things were already challenging. Um, and of course, they've been made even more challenging by COVID. Um, what uh, Global Citizen then worked with, um, with the UN to actually calculate uh, what sort of investment would it take um, so that we could meet the global goals by 2030, um, particularly, of course, focusing on um, the, the 59 poorest countries. And it takes investment from everyone. And, and that's why we all need to, and Global Citizen works at all levels, philanthropy, um, companies, the, the super funds. But as you can see there, um, particular priorities are on countries themselves, those 59 poorest countries um, investing in the issues in relation to health and education um, and hunger and poverty um, is, is really the view that that is uh, the biggest area where countries are making sure that their budgets are investing in the right things to, to end um, those issues of poverty for their citizens, um, but also then foreign donors. Um, and, you know, that's where from an Australian perspective, we work um, on the Australian government and governments around the world are encouraged um, to, uh, you know, maintain, increase um, and invest um, for the benefit of, uh, you know, the world in, in terms of uh, addressing these sustainable development goals. So in terms of our model, um, we like to think of it as a pop and policy approach to securing uh, very significant commitments in relation to ending extreme poverty. Um, so what we find is, is we have recruited millions of active members um, through the platform that Global Citizen has, which is our website, which uh, gives information, uh, directs people how they can take action, uh, creates uh, easy pathways for, for people to make it known that they can care about these issues, our governments and our um, corporate and community leaders to take action on them. Um, we've got this uh, incredible army of uh, artists and talent um, around the world uh, who speak up in relation to these issues and help, um, help add weight uh, to the arguments in relation to investment, um, but also um, work with our, our active members, our global citizens, um, to give them um, opportunities to connect to the, this, these um, superstars uh, in relation to rewards for taking action. So there's a very uh, direct feedback loop in relation to you take action and you can be recognised and acknowledged for that as well as um, obviously the broader objective of, of driving the change. Um, we of course work with uh, the most reputable thinkers and experts and policy makers around the world that's at, at government levels, um, at multilateral agencies, with the UN, with, um, you know, across, you know, where, where, where the leading thinkers are, um, we want to be there with them, helping to both um, 
you know, learn from and shape uh, those policies, but also communicate them out and make sure people know. Um, and then we we work with companies. We work with the biggest brands. Um, we work with um, uh, corporate and community leaders um, to drive the change as well. And so um, on the back of that, basically, we see this, this ongoing cycle um, where we bring together those people we've talked about, that we build a movement of citizens, um, that through information and education, we can channel uh, where global citizens take action. Um, we drive campaigns in relation to issues. And then of course, we make sure that uh, the commitments that have been made by, by governments and by multilateral agencies and, uh, and so on actually occur. So there's that real feedback Back loop in, in relation to not only uh, people enjoying getting up at a major you know, concert and, and making commitments, um, but that the money flows, that the investments are made, and that there's a significant difference made um, in relation to the outcomes of that investment. In Australia, our priorities um, uh, have been developed because obviously uh, there's many things to work on across the board. Um, the first and foremost, though, of course, is, is increasing investment in the Australian aid budget. Um, over um, you know, recent years, we've actually seen a decline in, in investment and it's been now at a floor of about $4 billion a year. Um, it was good to see there was actually a, a small increase, a 5% increase in the aid budget in the, in the recent um, budget. Uh, but we have to, you know, I think governments, our government and governments across the world are feeling the pressure as we're trying to solve, you know, problems at home. Um, we have to keep the fact that the Australian aid budget um, and our investment in our region and more broadly is absolutely fundamental um, to solving issues like COVID. We can't solve COVID at home without um, there being a worldwide solution in relation to, to COVID um, and so on. So um, real focus on making sure we continue to increase our investment in the aid budget. But there's many other areas as well um, where we've had an impact um, and where the government uh, you know, and campaigns can continue to um, make a difference in terms of those investments, whether it's through vaccines, um, through polio, um, and we've worked you know, uh, very closely um, with the other uh, groups across Australia and they're different groups on different issues um, that, that champion on these issues, um, but well, Polio Day, for example, um, coming up and we're holding a forum uh, this evening in relation to it. Um, education, uh, making sure we're investing uh, in education, water and sanitation and gender equality. Um, as you see, once again, those, those um, priorities in relation to the first six sustainable development goals. Um, so the combination of uh, campaigning on issues, uh, bringing together people to uh, add their voice in relation to it, um, putting pressure on the government, creating opportunities uh, for, for um, whether it's government or philanthropy or corporates to uh, make announcements in relation to their commitments and, and being recognised for that work, um, all then is a reinforcing model in terms of how we uh, continue to focus on, on the sustainable development goals. Um, we believe over the last um, five years, um, campaigns that we have been um, you know, either led or been active participants in relation to has actually um, helped make uh, an $850 million investment in international development. Um, and that's from, uh, you know, the Vaccine Alliance, from polio eradication, um, through the Global Fund, education and so on. So um, I'm very much of the view that a mobilised um, community can make it very clear um, that the government can't um, afford not to uh, continue to invest um, in these broader um, objectives for our world, um, as opposed to just the local objectives for the country. Um, so we're not asking, we don't ask people for money, but we are able to take action. Um, and those actions often are simple as, you know, a tweet, a petition, a phone call, an email, um, and how, how you can express, people can express their commitment to um, these issues. Um, and as I've said, Global citizens are rewarded to, with tickets to events and music festivals. Of course, a lot of that's gone online. Um, some of you may have watched um, 
uh, the One World Together at Home, which was a Lady Gaga initiative at the at the beginning of lockdown. Um, Global Citizen did that with Lady Gaga and it went out to hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, but we have 28 million actions taken by Global Citizens, um, big commitments having been made um, and, you know, hundreds of, of millions of lives who have been affected as a result of the work of Global Citizen. So, you know, from a neighbourhood house perspective, um, uh, and we can provide more information if people are interested, get involved, get on the app, um, go to the website, uh, get, get content about these issues around the sustainable development goals, hear what's happening, um, and then there's an opportunity for people to take action, um, make, you know, your voice heard in relation to it. And then the potential to also, um, you know, get get acknowledged for for those actions that you've taken, um, and be confident that you're contributing to driving the change. Um, if I've got, uh, um, I've got a, a quick video, a one minute video. Or are we out of time now? Now, no, no, no. Okay, Mary. just just for a bit of a feel good moment. Um, I'll run this. This is just a minute, and then I'll finish up. Very good. So I'll leave it at that. But, um, you know, a, a very accessible way for people to take action on these issues and, and make, you know, voices heard um, to encourage governments and, and world leaders um, to, to take action on these issues. Thanks so much, Mary. And um, given now the magic of Zoom, maybe you and I can have a coffee at some stage because I'd be really keen to hear a bit more about it and how um, sort of Anchor Neighbourhood Houses Victoria can get involved. Fantastic. Because for those of you who've heard me speak before, um, certainly one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about, and I, I really love the T-shirt that Hugh Jackman was wearing in there that said, um, dare to change the world. Mm -hmm. And I think as neighbourhood house managers, as a lot of you are, none of us are doing this for the money. We are doing it because we want to make the world a better place. And I know as corny as that sounds, it is the truth. And one of the things that um, in the lead up to the last federal election, um, again, for those of you who've heard, heard me speak, I bang on about this a lot, there were 50 marginal seats in the lead up to the last federal election. We have 250 neighbourhood houses across Australia within those 50 key seats. So there's a lot of opportunity for us as a movement of a thousand neighbourhood houses, more than McDonald's, uh, to be able to really, if we, if we talk from a united voice, to really have an impact on, on policy, I think. Um, and to, because as it is, I mean, and a lot of you, as I said before, are doing emergency food relief, which is great. And there's a real need for that. And, and but at the moment you're putting band-aids on at the ground. We need to be able to certainly um, anchor as well as the other peaks. We need to be working at that structural level to change the system so we don't have that level of demand in the first place. So, so um, yeah, it's a really important role that I think we can play as, as, um, as sort of global citizens in Australia. So I'm now gonna hand on to Jeremy Baskin Jeremy is from the University of Melbourne, where he's a fellow of Melbourne School of Government and Melbourne Law School. He's an active speaker on universal based income and he's published several articles in the conversation. I'm really excited to have Jeremy here today because again, I think it's an opportunity to, to change the way we talk about, um, to, to talk about what we often talk about as welfare. 
So, Jeremy, where are you? I can't see you, but I'm sure you're around somewhere. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Jeremy. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Over to you. <laughs> great, great. Hi, everybody. Um, I was asked just to speak very briefly about the idea of universal basic income. Um, and I was told that not many people in the meeting know about it. If you know about the concept before, just wave your hands like this. Okay, so maybe about half have got some sense. So I'll try, I'll try and start off at a fairly basic level. So really the idea of universal basic income is at one level, extremely simple. It basically means a regular payment to all adult citizens, unconditional, not means tested. So at what level, these are all political decisions, but just imagine in an Australian context, something about like the current pension level, say, for example, which is about 944, I think, uh, per person uh, per fortnight. Imagine 2,000 a month, imagine 24,000 per annum. That's sort of, that's the sort of ballpark that we're talking about. Enough for people to, to not live in poverty, but not to have a glorious, uh, a glorious um, luxurious existence. And the idea of universal basic income is really quite a, a dramatic idea. It's a really different way of thinking about work, of thinking about welfare, and of thinking about citizenship. So if we think about the work system that we have currently, really we value paid employment only. Care work is typically not recognized and often not valued, whether it's care of children, care of your elderly parents, uh, you know, whatever the circumstances might be. Studying is not regarded as work. Um, and I think what the COVID pandemic has shown us is that Solutions like Job Seeker, which is really just a beefed up version of the existing um, unemployment package, is really unable to deal with informal and casualized work. So what we have in our current model of work, is, it assumes something like you get born, you get educated, you get a job, you get retired, you die. And the reality is in fact that jobs for life are no longer possible. Automation is accelerating these changes. The idea that we will have one job for life uh, rather than many, a succession of different types of work um, seems not to be uh, realistic. So it seems to me that our future will involve some combination of training, work, more training, care, time off, study, work, in, in many, many different combinations. And in fact, I would argue we already are seeing something like that. Um, also, we've gone, got into a situation where work has, has become a, a primary source of meaning for people. And I accept that it is a source of meaning for very many people, but with so many precarious jobs, so many casualized jobs, especially for younger people, so many what is sometimes been called bullshit jobs. Uh, I don't know if people have read it. There's a remarkably interesting article about bullshit jobs that I'd strongly recommend people have a look at. So no wonder mental health problems are, are rising. Addiction is rising because our model of what work we value doesn't match the reality of where we are today. We have a similar thing if we look at our welfare system. All of our welfare systems assume a lack, an inability, um, an inability to participate in paid employment in particular because of age or disability or unemployment or not being job ready or being work shy. And correspondingly, the welfare system we have, the benefit system we have for unemployment is punitive, it's conditional, and it's really low. As we know, under not currently under the current uh, job seeker, but under the normal job seeker, actually large numbers of people are actually in poverty receiving um, state benefits. So the, the idea of a universal basic income is, is to guarantee a modest livable income. It's to recognize the value of currently unrecognized work. It's to ease the movement of, of people between work and study and volunteering and caring for parents, caring for children over the course of a lifetime. 
it gives more power to people to refuse useless, insecure, or overly casualized or underpaid work, or to insist simply on being decently paid. It allows the abolition of unemployment benefits, pension payments, and their associated bureaucracies. But most importantly, I would argue, it builds citizenship, it builds solidarity, it builds a sense of being all in it together. So that's really the underlying idea behind a universal basic income. It's to replace our current systems of welfare with a more generalized um, grant to which all citizens are entitled. Now, it's a very radical proposal. It has really big implications for how we organize the world. And it's, it's sort of proud to be that. Uh, and it's also expensive. Although, of course, one can argue expensive compared to what? We've all had a bit of a shock during this current pandemic as to what now counts as expensive and what doesn't count as expensive. But in truth, it is expensive. And so some people have thought about what stepping stones are needed to get towards this direction. And a number of really interesting ideas have come up. Perhaps the most interesting in Australia is something called the Livable Income Guarantee. I don't know if people have come across this. Um, it's been developed in, the, in recent months, trying to think through some of the lessons from the COVID uh, pandemic and some of the difficulties in getting the money to the right people in, in, this, in these difficult times. And it's also trying to think about ways of, uh, of doing a slimmed down version of universal basic income that, that is more fiscally uh, sustainable in the shorter term. So, I won't talk much about livable income guarantee, but that's the sort of stepping stone approach towards universal basic income with an Australian uh, flavor to it. If you want, I can share the links to that paper or to a summary of that paper, uh, if people would like to learn uh, more about, about that. Maybe I should stop there and we should just take questions unless you want to do questions right at the end. Thanks, Jeremy. We might keep going and do questions at the end. I should have mentioned that if people have questions, if you pop them in the chat, um, I'm keeping an eye on them and I'll, I'll um, pass those on to the panel at the end. But the reason I wanna keep going, Jeremy, is because you've given, um, you've Absolutely. played the theory, like you've, that's the theory. And now we're gonna hear from Minna from Finland. Uh, she is from the Social Insurance Institute of Finland, which is a government agency that provides basic economic security for everybody living in Finland. And, and she's a bit of an expert in this space. So again, by teaming in, teaming and Jeremy and Minna, it's an opportunity to have the theory and to have the practice. And Finland so really, has done a very famous recent trial on- Yes, and she's gonna be talking about that today. So we're incredibly lucky to have you. And especially cause I think it's 6 a.m. or something where you are. Um, so thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and, uh, um, sorry about my sound. It's it's five o'clock um, in the morning in Finland, so I just woke up and <laughs> and tried to give you a very um, hopefully a very interesting presentation about the Finnish um, UBI experiment implemented in um, in two thousand seventeen and eighteen. I hope I can uh, share the slideshow. Hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, now I'm in the end of the presentation. Um, just a minute. Here. Okay, um, first, um, the, I'm not working actually in the Social Insurance Institution of Finland anymore. Um, I changed my uh, place of work. I am currently working in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment as a senior specialist, but I'm still working in the evaluation research group, um, um, making a study of, of the impacts of the Finnish basic income experiment. I want to um, send greetings. I'm actually at the moment working um, remotely from um, the southernmost island of Finland, uh, Orta. That's a really beautiful island. If you ever come to Finland, please come. <laughs> and whenever it's uh, again possible, you should definitely go to the archipelago of Turku. It's, it's the most beautiful place in the world, as far as I can say. 
well, I've never been to Australia, so I don't know how, how beautiful it's, it's there. Um, some background for the experiment. It was not actually foreseeable that we are coming, or we are going to have this kind of experiment. We had an election in 2015 and we got a quite a conservative um, cabinet, a government for Finland. And we didn't expect to even discuss basic income. We haven't actually spoke about basic income very much in Finland. Uh, only the smaller parties, um, the Green Alliance and, and left, uh, Green Party and the Left Alliance have been talking about basic income actually for decades. But I think they have not been taken very seriously. It's been something that they have advocated, but um, they've been very small parties in, in the Finnish context. Um, but, and they were not in the government when the government decided to write in their governmental program that they want to have the basic income experiment. Um, I think why it was possible was that um, the government wanted to search various ways in order to increase employment. So um, the basic income experiment in Finland was actually an em employment experiment. It was an experiment to um, see whether basic income could make it easier for people to accept jobs to return to, to the labor market. Because we know that Finnish social security system is quite compl complicated. It's, it's uh, people sometimes don't know what they're entitled to. And um, well, if they are unemployed um, and they want to secure their income, they may not take a job, for example, a couple of hours a week because they don't know what happens to their um, benefits. They may get at least three benefits at the same time. They may get unemployment benefits, housing allowance, social assistance, perhaps some disability benefits. And if you consider the whole family, there may be kind of a dozen different kind of benefits they are, they are receiving. So it may be really difficult to kind of think through what happens if you go to work and you lose some of the benefits, which benefits, how much money, when you're going to get your salary, and et cetera. So we know that there are some bureaucratic traps, instant, um, kind of income traps. And what this conservative government aimed to see was that whether um, UBI could tackle some of these problems. They didn't have anything else in mind at first. They just wanted to see whether we can increase employment. But uh, when this uh, bill, because we had a law for this experiment when it went to uh, the Committee for Social Affairs, they were in, in the opinion that we should also try to look at what happens to well-being of people, how, how they're subject, subject to well, well-being develops. So uh, what happened was that uh, the government gave 20 million euros for the experiment, which in the Finnish context is a lot of money. We're a small nation with five and a half million people living in, in, in the country. And also some extra funds for the planning. So 20 million euros for only uh, to implement the experiment itself. But it was, it had to be planned because Nothing like this was ever experimented in the world. This, this was the first of kind, the Finnish experiment, a nationwide obligatory experiment with, uh, it was a scientific experiment. It was, was, from the day one, it was planned by researchers, scientific researchers, uh, in order to, to provide very re reliable scientific uh, um, results. There was some competition for the funds and a research group led by Professor Oli Kangas, working at that time in the Social Insurance Institution of Finland, um, won this competition and with a very good plan. And they worked their, um, they started their work in the mid-October 2015 and delivered the first report on March uh, 2016 and uh, which, based on which they then had to or the government had to choose what kind of model we're going to implement, experiment. And based on the decision, uh, which was to uh, implement a partial 
basic income uh, research group continued their work and delivered the um, second report on the experiment in December 2016. And actually, the decision, the government of the decision of the experiment was made in December, and the experiment started on the 1st of uh, January 2017 and lasted for two years, which was also planned. Um, despite the rumors that it was supposed to be longer, it wasn't. It was only for two years. Uh, so at the timetable, the schedule was really tight. Uh, the government wanted to have everything in their governmental period, which is in Finland four years. They wanted to have the planning, the implementation for two years, and also the first results within four years, and it's a very short time. I just wanted to show um, uh, a graph of, about, about, uh, of the Finnish social security system, just to show uh, what kind of benefits we are paying uh, and who is paying and what kind of services we're delivering. Um, as regards uh, services, uh, the response, uh, the responsibility of the municipalities, we have about 300 municipalities in Finland and they deliver the services, health and social services. Then we have the Social Insurance Institution of Finland, which pays out all the basic level benefits. We have a two-tier system. We have basic level benefits and also um, earnings related benefits. And when it comes to unemployment benefits, we have an earnings related unemployment benefit for those who are insured. It's, a, it's voluntary insure, um, insurance. And then we have uh, basic level unemployment benefits for other people who are not insured or they are not entitled to earnings related benefits for some reasons. And for example, because they've received um, or reach the maximum days of uh, receiving earnings related benefits, which is four or 500 days. Uh, the basic level unemployment benefit in Finland is after taxes, 560 euros. And it's paid for everybody who's unemployed filling the criteria. If not, they are entitled to social assistance, uh, which is a little less, but anyways, in Finland, you're always in all circumstances, you're always entitled to some benefit. If it's not unemployment benefits, it's, uh, for example, housing allowance or the last resort social assistance. So in a way, we already had a basic um, income. Uh, nobody is left without some kind of benefit. Um, as I already told, uh, what the government decided then based on the first report from the research group was to experiment partial level, partial basic income. Uh, it replaced uh, the basic benefits, um, sickness benefits, etc., but not uh, the earnings related benefits. And what our constitutional committee said that nobody should be, after implementing the law for experiment, Nobody should be uh, in a worse situation than before implementation, implementation of the law. So at least they should get the 560 euros after taxes. And that what was also then decided that um, we are going to pay or we paid for those who um, were in the experiment, who was selected to the experiment to receive basic income, they received 560 euros unconditionally. This is what was then the difference main difference was that it was unconditional it was it could not be taken away even they had a bad day even if they were not able to uh, search for job because of the criteria for getting unemployment benefit in Finland is getting stricter and stricter every day unemployed feel themselves very kind of second kind of b-class citizens they every day they have to prove that they are worth worthy citizens in order to get 560 euros after taxes. So this was unconditional. And I think that's in this context and in the Nordic welfare state context, this is the main difference between basic income and other benefits. We selected from those who received um, basic level unemployment benefits. We selected 2000 unemployed to the experiment. All the rest of those who received unemployment benefits at the same time formed a control group for the research. So it was a scientific experiment. 
based on randomized controlled trial. And uh, nobody had ever done anything like that in the whole world. It was um, one of kind and it still is. Uh, there are, of course, many um, experiments now planned because Professor Kangas has been traveling all around the world to uh, give an um, expertise help for those planning this kind of experiments. Um, there was quite a few restrictions in the experiment. One was that uh, the tax authorities had not enough time because the time schedule was really tight. They had not enough time to build a taxation system to tax away the basic income if people went to work. So they could keep the whole 560 euros even if they got work. And this is, of course, a very high incentive to accept work. On the other hand, we're talking about people receiving unemployment benefits from Kela, basic level benefits, which means that most of them, um, I'm not going to any deeper to our system, um, but it means that most of them had been unemployed for a longer time. So it's really hard. It's, it's even for people at work, really hard to find work at the moment in Finland, but when it comes to long-term un unemployed, it's almost impossible. So even if the incentive was very high, we didn't expect to see very um, high uh, employment effects, so very strong employment effects. But what we did uh, in, in the eval evaluation, we uh, collected registers, which was based on law. We were allowed to uh, follow the people. We were interested in employment, but also on well-being, um, subjective well-being. And then, then, of course, when we look at the registers, we can find out almost everything about people's lives, because in Finland, we have a really good registers on all the residents in Finland, not just citizens, but all the residents in Finland. What we found then in the evaluation um, is that there were some differences, not in, in the first year, but in the second year, 2018, we saw some differences in the employment so that those received um, basic income, they worked a little more. When, when we measured it in, in working days, they, they worked a little more than those who didn't receive basic income. Um, and there were some bigger differences, for example, when it comes to immigrants and housewives, but we have to go and analyze a little bit more um, about where these differences come from, why there were kind of bigger differences between certain subgroups of populations. But what we saw when we collected a survey um, data, we called people and asked about their subjective health we found significant differences in subjective, subjective well-being, including health, financial stress, happiness, trust, confidence. So they trusted more, they had less stress, they were more confined, confident about their future, uh, they had less uh, psychological problems, they had better uh, cognitive um, abilities. So on every measure that we had, they felt themselves better when we asked it in the end of um, the experiment. They also experienced less bureaucracy. And this all after um, taking into care, uh, into uh, account, for example, income. So um, on the same level of income, those who received basic income felt that they, for example, um, they were more satisfied with their income. Now, that's interesting. So even if they got the same amount of money, they were more satisfi satisfied with income than those who not, didn't receive basic income that received the conditional the, um, unemployment allowance or were at work. Um, then there were a couple of researchers from the University of Helsinki who um, made an interview, uh, interview study. And those results are also highly interesting. Um, they were very mixed. Um, feelings about the experiment. Some thought that it's, it was uh, kind of saved their life. They were really happy for two years uh, not to get uh, bullied by the PES, but uh, some were not that happy. They felt that there were some kind of, because there were only 2000 of them and we 
do not know about very much about UBI in Finland, and also not the street level bureaucrats don't know much about the UBI. So they were kind of a um, how's the word in English? I don't actually know, but they were kind of um, targeted for some reason with more attention. It was for some. It was actually even harder to more difficult to get other benefits because. For example, in Kela, not all people knew, even if it was implemented by Kela, not all street level bureaucrats, not all the um, those working on, on, on with clients didn't know about UBI and they had to take kind of find out what it is, what is it and, and how it should be combined with other benefits. But it's, it's very interesting. We're going to publish a book um, next year about the results in English by Edward Elgo in, in UK and uh, then you can read about the results in English too. Uh, what actually was a little bit problematic uh, um, when we look at, like I look at uh, the experiment as a researcher is that the government who was really, really keen to find ways in, in order to uh, increase employment, that seems to be everything that matters is to increase employment. They, want, they implemented an activation model uh, in the beginning of 2018. So in the midst of the basic income experiment, uh, the activation model was uh, only stick, no carrots at all, only stick to the uh, unemployed. Um, they had to, within three months period, they had to fill a very strict criteria in order to keep the full, uh, full unemployment benefits, otherwise, the unemployment benefit was decreased by uh, 5%. And we saw when we studied that, that those who didn't fill the criteria within the first three months, they were not able to fill it um, later on. So it was really something else than basic income experiment. And that's what makes the evaluation of, of the UBI experiment very difficult. And this was also told to them minister responsible at that time of the employment policies and the researchers in, in the evaluation group were really um, not very happy, including Professor Oli Kangas. Okay, what now? Um, we know uh, we have, we had a very good experiment that provides information on the meaning of unconditionality. What it means to get unconditional benefit? Um, we know we have we have a couple of universal, totally universal benefits in the Nordic welfare states, but it's still very interesting to see what it means to kind of is not the, the living of people, to trust them. Uh, it's kind of a money of trust to give people. They can do what they want with the money and not be screened all the time. Uh, we talked about having a, another experiment on negative income tax in Finland on this governmental period. But due to Corona, mainly due to Corona, uh, there are no plans to experiment anything at the moment. But we have a committee uh, of um, a social security committee, which began their work in the spring. And they have eight years time to um, reform the whole social security system in Finland. It's too complicated. It's not, um, it has too many traps for people. Um, and I think one aim of that, Reform is also to increase well being, at least I hope so. So I think the results from our experiments are discussed in that context. Thank you. And sorry for taking that much time. It's very hard to explain the experiment in a very short time. No, no, thank you so much. Anna. That was um, really, really interesting. And uh, just before I introduce our next speaker, Jeremy, did you want to comment on any of that? Because I know, um, as I say, this is sort of where we're linking the theory to the practice. Jeremy, are you there? We might have, oh, Jeremy? Yes, um, no, let me not say more at this stage. This has been a very well reported experiment globally. People have been watching it really closely. Um, it, it was an experiment with two groups of people who were already uh, not employed. Um, so, so in a sense, one which which of course limits the ability to see what the society-wide effects uh, would, would be um, uh, of the implementation of a basic income. 
Um, but it's given some very useful insights. One of the most interesting insights is that uh, it didn't make people less likely to look for work, is my understanding. And the second uh, big insight is that their overall happiness was extremely, was a great deal higher uh, than, than the people who were on the existing system. And it seems to me those are two important findings just on their own, even if you took it as, as simple as, as that. I agree. And, and certainly when you've, um, particularly if you've been out of work for a while and you're looking for work, it's so much easier when you're feeling happy and good about yourself than when you're not. So even that alone, I think, is a pretty um, interesting outcome to come out from this. Uh, there's some really good um, questions in the chat for Mina, which we'll get to at the end. Um, but this is the part, as I mentioned earlier, there's um, neighbourhood houses, lots of neighbourhood houses doing work in relation to this SGG. Uh, and this is the time where we're going to hear from a couple of those houses. Uh, the first house is from, um, it's a Victoria Melbourne house uh, out in Dandenong in Melbourne's outer east. Um, we've, we have um, Dalal Smiley from Wellsprings for Women. In 1994, Wellsprings opened its doors in Dandenong as a one day per week drop-in, offering a family friendly environment. Um, now it's open five days a week and it provides lots of programs and services tailored to meet the needs of women who face social, cultural, economic and political barriers to participation. And uh, Dahl's here to talk about their creative in enterprising women program, which won the Victorian Learn Local pre-accredited pathway program in 2019. So really looking forward to hearing about that. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose I'm getting some assistance with the sharing the screen. Yes, Emma. I will share that one. Thank you, Emma. Um, oh, sorry, I just closed the chat. So uh, today, yes, I am uh, quite, uh, I suppose, chuffed in having to having the opportunity to share with you our uh, Creative Enterprising Women project. And um, I, it's kind of like shifting a little bit from talking at a global level, international level, and zooming in or at a local level as to uh, the little things we do at the local level to, to make a difference in people's lives. And um, at Wellsprings, we are a women only, organization and we provide a range of services in terms of like uh, literacy and numeracy so we are funded by ACFI which is the through the education department and we provide a range of uh, education for women but we are always looking at ways to uh, for pathways for them for employment and further training the majority of the women we work with are from migrant and refugee background and they have very low literacy and numeracy levels as well as low education, previous education levels. So um, the challenges have been that for many of the women, they've been coming and are trying to increase their level of English proficiency for a long time. And they, it's, we realized that despite all their efforts and, and recognizing that the trauma they, they have in previous experiences through migration and their refugee journey, that a lot of the, uh, the trauma they carry, it, it prohibits them from reaching a level of English proficiency high enough for them to compete in, in getting a job in the, through mainstream channels. So we had to think outside the box and say, okay, what can we do uh, in conjunction with the women to build on, on their existing skills rather than get them to develop uh, new skills that they perhaps find, find it very difficult and challenging. So uh, that's how the Creative Enterprising Women started, is by thinking outside the box and saying, okay, well, okay, they may not have high level of proficiency in English, uh, but they are very talented uh, uh, women with, with existing skills. So let's find out what their skills are and how we can nurture those skills in order for them to find ways to engage in income uh, generating ventures. 
So we started uh, in term three, almost in 2018. We used the, the earlier 2018 to develop, uh, co-design the program with a number of the, uh, the women who were attending Wellsprings and uh, applied for funding through, through ECFI. And we um, started experimenting with that program by doing a number of things with the women. So, so that's what why Creative Enterprise in Women started, is about looking at the skills that the women already have and hoping that through those skills, we can take them to a, um, a, a further training or to engage in self-employment or, or being involved in a social enterprise. So what was done since 2018? We go to the next slide, please. Um, so we started working with them in discovering their own uh, skills, their own abilities, their own uh, aspirations, doing that kind of confidence building to begin with, what their goals are, what are their values, what are their aspirations, doing a lot of that foundational type work. And then through that, uh, we, we, number of the women involved have been able to, we did, we've done, for example, like a skills audit, find out what, uh, what they're passionate about, what are the things they feel very confident about. And um, next, uh, next one, next slide shows you case studies of some of the women who have been involved. Like for example, Chitrika, who came to us as Wellsprings uh, she already had some a qualification from Sri Lanka as a as a reflex reflexologist, but she couldn't participate couldn't actually use that skill in Australia. And we worked closely with her for quite some time. And she she did actually win a lo learn local award um, as a participant in this program, uh, where she really participated in so many programs at Wellsprings and then moved to Creative Enterprising Women when she heard about it. And um, we referred her, for example, to external, other external services like Launch Me that is uh, provided by, by another organization. And through that, they were able to get her, uh, support her to uh, get her qualification approved in Australia. And she started practicing as a reflexologist. And we offered, we introduced her to a number of events where she was able to uh, uh, promote her service and use and use her skill as a reflexologist. Um, so that was just because, but she also, uh, uh, you know, got involved in other programs like Sabre Plus where, uh, you know, teach, teaches women about financial literacy and a lot of the women that we have worked with have never really had opportunities to manage their own money before. So it was a big challenge for them to engage in learning about how to run a business, what is taxation, and learning a lot about different ways of saving and uh, a whole heaps of issues to do with, 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 lit with financial literacy. Um, now, We've had about uh, 22 women in that first course who were involved. And um, here you can see, for example, Christine is one of them. A lot of them do have a lot of issues as well. So it's not just dealing with the, you know, with the income generation and financial literacy. They face, they face uh, some have had issues to do with family violence. Some have issues to do with anxiety and depression. Um, some v some were struggling with visa issues. Uh, so we've had to also make sure that as they participate in this program that we provide those kind of wraparound services that support them in remaining engaged, remaining motivated and not giving up. There were issues, I think it was mentioned in Mina's presentation about, about the fear of losing existing benefits. And that was a real uh, challenge as well, where we've actually invited Centrelink to come and talk to the women and explain about, you know, how, how much they can earn before they can, uh, before their Centrelink payments get affected. So 
So we had to take into consideration the existing barriers they have as well in taking them to the next step of venturing, uh, venturing out and starting to rely on getting their own income. Christine, for example, her skill was she, she loved uh, importing clothes from, from her country of origin and wanting to establish a business here of selling those clothes. And we, we assisted her with promoting that business and building a portfolio and having a logo and um, moving on to um, the next step. I, I, she wanted, for example, to get a microfinance in order to be able to bring a whole lot of stock from overseas and be able to sell it here in Australia. Of course, most of the women are at the moment impacted by, by the current uh, pandemic and we are keeping them engaged and um, keep supporting them so that uh, you know they don't lose complete hope and drop everything because it's been a really uh, long journey and we want to make sure that they continue to keep to, to remain motivated to, uh, in, uh, to improve their business possibilities. Um, and we had Lilith, for example, and Lilith um, had, is, is very talented, very talented, but did lack a lot of confidence in, uh, in her own abilities and in how she comes across to people. She makes beautiful cakes. She's, uh, she's amazing, creative person. And what we did with Lilith is help her in uh, developing her presentation skills. So we said, look, don't just think about making cakes and cupcakes and selling, but also we've had a lot of women from many different schools around our area who wanted to learn how to run, for example, birthday parties for their children. So what we did with Lilith is uh, help her in developing a PowerPoint presentation and uh, about how to, uh, uh, how to organize a birthday party for your children. And uh, she developed like a PowerPoint and we, you know, we built, we sort of supported her in how to present that. And she practiced it in front of um, some of our participants at the center. And then she started, uh, she started presenting that to other women and other moms at many different schools in our area. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful, ex uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity for Lilith because her sense of, you know, um, self-confidence has really, you know, went up so high since that since that time, and um, she conti we continue to be involved with with all with all the women who have been involved in that program. With new women are joining as well, and at the moment we are running it online for new women who have joined. So these are just three of the case studies that I'm sharing with you. But there are many more women and they all come with very different skills at very different stages of development of their business ideas. So with the next slide, I'll show you, for example, that the, what, what has been happening is that some, for example, what you're seeing here is Shisrika with her reflexology client. The other one is um, one who actually makes a lot of uh, products from using leather. And what we've done is giving uh, women opportunities to in get involved in local markets. So the Dandenong Makers Market and other markets in various schools where they invited us for that end of year, for example, Christmas fate or anything like that. And the women will go and display some of the products or the services they provide. And we're able to, for example, have, uh, you know, be paid for those services and which for many, this has been a great, exciting thing to actually earn their own, their own money for a change. Um, the next slide shows you that as a result of this program, a group of women have branched out into a, the women's cooking group as well. And that's going very strongly. Uh, and we have been able to work with uh, about 12 women who have a passion for cooking and we've had, uh, we have partnered with a local school, St. John's Regional College. They have their own graduate restaurants and we've 
partnered with their students to uh, organize a number of dinners where we uh, where they were open to the public uh, but we charged for those dinners so the women earned an income out of that so that particular dinner was in june last year and five of the women uh, uh, cooked five different types of cuisines and for the multicultural dinner and was a great success we could only fit 60 people in that uh, restaurant but they were all um, it was an amazing event and our plan is to do more of that in partnership with that local school uh, but they also going to be they also have catered for various uh, events and meetings with agencies in our local area who know that we have this women's cooking program and they wanted to support it and encourage the women uh, to keep working at establishing our, themselves as a social enterprise. Uh, next slide shows you some of the, the other women who were involved as well. Uh, one who um, is keen on, uh, or she already sells some of the bread, she makes kisra bread and she sells it to the local uh, shops in, in Dandenong. So where we are now is that uh, late last year we, next slide please Emma, so late last year we uh, had discussions with um, space to be in based in St Kilda. They have a little cafe there and they have a, a shop uh, and we we are partnering with them in having they want us to run the cafe or they want the women to run the, the cafe and also to display the products that they make in in their shop at the space to be so we thought it's a great opportunity for the women because um the area around St Kilda is an affluent area we know that there will be more um a demand on you know like there's they have better opportunities than in Dandenong to sell their products um and also for the cafe, for them to make, uh, you know, Lilith can, for example, make her cakes and her cupcakes and have them available at the cafe. The other women can cook, you know, uh, and have some uh, people can buy lunches there and, and breakfast and, and lunch. It's mainly the cafe is open for those two things. So we're really excited about that opportunity. We were going to start with it this year. We were, we were all geared up for that, but unfortunately at the moment, uh, both the cafe and the shop are closed. And as soon as they reopen again, we will be able to resume our plans for involving the women in, the, in that venture as well. So um, the, our next, our, what happened early this year when the pandemic started, a lot of the women got involved in the emergency relief and were cooking and, um, and providing meals to women, to families who are facing hardship. And um, at the moment, we're going to be applying to get funding for a food truck so that they, women can use it to cook for, for families who need food. But at the same time, they can also use it to sell uh, uh, food to um, corporates and other agencies uh, and also we're gonna, we are gonna be involved in the um, railway crossing removal projects. Um, so we've got those opportunities so that they can earn money and at the same time they can provide volunteering opportunities uh, for families who need food. So I suppose the sky is the limit for the creative enterprising women. And um, we are very excited about where this is taking us into the future. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Thanks so much, Joelle, that's amazing. And, and certainly you touched on a, a couple of really interesting points. You talked about microfinance. I think that's a really, um, having access to no interest or low interest loans, um, particularly for women who might not have a very established credit history, I think is incredibly important because we see what happens when they don't have access to that and they end up with payday lenders and, and they can end up in a massive debt cycle. So that's certainly something I'm pretty keen to have keeping discussions about with a view to make it accessible to more of our, to more of the people who use this. Now, our final speaker I'm going to introduce is Gail from, um, who's the CEO of the Spears Centre in Perth. And um, I sat next to you at a conference about 12 months ago, so it's nice to see you. And, um, and please, like, what are you guys doing in relation to SDG1 over in Perth? 
Yeah, um, well, firstly, I just want to say thank you for the invitation um, by ANCA. Uh, and also I just wanted to acknowledge um, the tra traditional custodians of the land um, in which I'm on in Perth, Western Australia, the Wajak Noongar people. Um, just want to say acknowledge the past and, and walk hand, walking hand in hand um, in the journey for, for a better future. Um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal people that might be present with us today. Um, so the Spear Centre, for, just quickly by way of background for those that might not be aware, the Spear Centre, um, we're in Perth, Western Australia. We're a neighbourhood centre in a suburb called Heathridge, which is in the northern parts of the Perth metropolitan area. Um, our mission is to create strong, caring, resilient communities. Uh, we've, we're actually turning 40 this year um, and we're part of the, what's called a financial counselling network, which is a consortium of 13 other not-for-profit organisations funded through the state government. Um, we're actually the largest financial counselling service in the northern parts of WA. Um, we've provided, last year we provided um, just over a thousand clients with emergency relief and just under that for financial counselling. Um, one of the programs that we delivered, um, and we started this prior to COVID with a grant that we received through um, ANCA was our Financial Resilience Empowerment and Education Program. Um, TSC has widely recognised the importance and significance of financial literacy um, and support along um, with its interrelation with community wellbeing. So that was very much a focus for us, um, and particularly with the vulnerable commu communities around um, our local area. Um, the main focus for that program was to support um, our Aboriginal community who we had actually formed a connection um, through one of the respected community leaders in the area. So we were able to build um, a cultural bridge to engage those communities, which historically had been difficult to engage um, with the neighborhood center. And through that, we were able to actually um, support them um, to access our financial hardship services, which um, included our financial counseling. Um, it's actually a, um, a prominent suicide and, and poverty um, researcher in WA, George um, Giagatis, um, he evidenced that the common thread to First Nations suicides is poverty. Um, and along that, with there was a strong correlation to domestic violence and substance abuse. So, um, and we've certainly seen that as a consistent um, theme across the many different cohorts of communities that we support. So, the the focus on poverty and alleviating um, that through education, awareness, and and certainly financial literacy was very much um, something that we wanted to to focus on. Um, the co-location of, of financial counselling within neighbourhood centres is. is seems to be a relatively young concept and definitely in, in WA. Um, TSC is probably one of the few, if that, in WA that has co-located financial counselling services with a neighbourhood centre. Um, but it's that holistic wraparound support, um, which has been mentioned a few times, that's um, absolutely crucial to building um, that resilience and um, both financially and social resilience within, within the communities. Um, we provide communities that support to be able to navigate through the financial hardship, um, you know, and also through crisis. Uh, one, of the, one of the messages that I've, I've been trying to um, raise awareness around is the fact that crisis doesn't discriminate. Um, it often surprises people that we have, um, when I tell them that we've had surgeons as clients attending our financial counselling, um, you know, engineers, execs, um, so, you know, crisis can, can reach and touch every single one of us. So when that crisis um, impacts people, that resilience is, is the um, difference between somebody that goes into, um, you know, that ongoing financial hardship or, or being able to maintain um, and to, to address and, and continue. Um, so I you know the, um, the video that Mary um, showed that through the Global Citizen Australia work, um, the scale of that is is really, really, it's, um, it's surreal. Um, and it, 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 almost, um, it almost feels as if the work that we're doing at, at that grassroots level is, it's, it's, you know, just a tiny little drop in an ocean of the grand scale of, of the problem. But I think particularly um, as we respond to the economic and social impact of COVID, the value of the grassroots organisations, the neighbourhood centres, the community resource centres, um, supporting those positive outcomes at that local level 
is going to be absolutely crucial um, if we're going to meet those global outcomes as well. So um, I think it's something that it's it's really highlighted um, a lot of the a lot of the value of of having those grassroots organisations um, and the impact that we make at a, at a local level and how that um, correlates to those global scale issues. Um, Awareness workshops facilitated through our financial capability and financial counselling teams is another area that we um, we provide to try to increase that financial resilience, the financial literacy skills. Um, often those are actually referred through our internal programs um, that we hold at the Naples Centre. So there's a lot of cross referrals um, that we have, and once people. Um, are comfortable with and, and familiar with the Naples Centre. We build that trust, we build that rapport with communities. It's a lot easier to then refer into um, some of those um, some of those other programs that may not necessarily be the first point of you know sort of first point of contact for people. Um, we also provide emergency relief. Um, we've actually um, developed some collaborations with different food relief providers, emergency relief um, providers. Um, during the COVID period, we, we were coming across situations where particularly vulnerable communities weren't able to um, access food. So um, there's some service providers that we've um, partnered with that will deliver food support. Um, and we have an agreement where we can provide emergency relief. Um, so they have food delivered to their door um, in, if they need um, basic essentials or um, and they're not able to um, provide that financially. Um, and we've also um, started um, linkages with the Emergency Relief and Food Access Service, which is um, on the back of the Hug Service Centre. Um, it was an initiative, initiative through Anglicare um, to support um, communities whereby due to the moratoriums around utilities, the need shifted um, in communities to more the food relief and the emergency relief support. So we've, um, you know, we've um, collaborated with them in order to be able to extend our support to a wider, um, a wider network just um, you know, beyond our local community as well. Um, that's pretty much um, us. That's pretty much us. I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, so I don't want to go over. Um, if there's any areas of interest or if I haven't covered anything, um, if people have, would like any further information, I'm happy to, to speak to them after this event. Um, you know, we'll take questions. Yeah, but thank you so much. That was, um, again, lots of food for thought. And listening to you, I think that's, as I mentioned before, I'm really keen to see how we can create connections so we can get more microfinance available through houses, but also financial literacy, because I do think we need to empower particularly women to understand their financial situation and and to really, um, to really sort of tap into that knowledge and to empower themselves with it. So I think I'm also been having conversations with Financial Counselling Victoria, and I'll reach out if there's a national peak um, to think about how we can um, create more of these opportunities through neighbourhood houses, because I think people would really benefit from that. Normally, I like to finish these um, seminars with some calls to action. This one's, a, I mean, I've got, I feel as I've got some actions for myself and some areas to follow up. Um, and I think Mary having a coffee with you at some stage would be really useful and maybe we can have a chat about what some of the stuff that you've heard today and maybe if you're thinking there's things that we could be doing as a sector to be working together to um, for that common cause. Um, to that end, and I'm sorry we haven't got a lot of time for questions today, but I might give the final word to Mary. Um, I mean, based on everything you've heard, is there anything that jumps out at you that, that is a sector where we can really probably be um, doing some work? Um, thanks, Nicole. I think um, it comes back to what you said at the beginning, actually, um, is that, you know, you're an incredible network that has deep knowledge and experience of the communities in which you work um, and the people that, um, you know, you work um, to benefit and um, organising around a couple of key things that you want to drive change, um, using that power of that knowledge and expertise at a very local level to, to have an evidence base, um, and then advocating for change both directly, um, whether it's, you know, to government generally, um, or but but also using the, the collective voices of um, you know the, the 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 thousands and thousands and thousands of people who um, use the services um, you know is very powerful and so you know I would um, I think it's important to work out what it is those couple of issues and and um, have that collective voice 
um, and go not only with the issues, but also with some of the solutions. Um, so there's some work that you can collectively do to try and uh, drive those changes, um, whether it be within the operation of neighbourhood houses, which I know, you know, you've had, there's been lots of policy issues over the time, but even more broadly for the clients that you um, that, that you work with um, and they may, you know, such as such as the, the universal basic income. I think that one's a hard stretch, um, but, uh, you know, there's plenty of things at the moment um, that uh, need thought, need solutions and need advocacy um, as we come out of COVID um, and, and there's an opportunity for change. Fantastic. So 406,000 um, people use a neighbourhood house across Australia every week. So, um, so you're right, we actually do have a lot of people and, and I agree about UBI. It's a kind of that concept of maybe sometimes shoot for the moon and end up with the stars. Um, but for me, the biggest thing, and I'm, I'm a very um, practical person, if we could get neighbourhood houses linked in with or financial counsellors linked into neighbourhood houses, um, that's certainly an, a very tangible ask that I think um, I'd like to see government put some money behind because I think it will have enormous benefit moving forward. Thank you so much to all of the presenters today for putting so much time and energy into the presentations, especially thank you to Minna from Finland for getting up so early. Um, but look, fantastic presentation, everybody, and we'll hopefully see you all back for the next one. Thanks, everybody.